Broadly speaking, my research is concerned with the intimate lives of disabled people. And the proje my projects and my graduate students' projects have spanned issues of sexuality, gender identity, gender, gender independence, friendships, kinships, families, and parenting. I'm a qualitative researcher, and I use primarily arts-informed methodologies, but I pair these with more conventional um, uh, qualitative methodologies of ethnography, narrative, discursive techniques, interviewing techniques, and so forth. Um, think conceptually, my research embraces what's called the cultural turn within disability studies, which seeks to deconstruct and reimagine what is meant by disability categories and systems of classification, and along with that, deconstruct systems of race class, gender, sexual orientation, and so forth. At the same time, my work attends to the lived conditions and lived experiences of disabled people. So um, like many marginalized groups, disabled people have had an ambivalent relationship with health research. So we welcome it sometimes, it's offered, offered technological and medical advances that have eased our pain, um, freed us up from institutional intervention, extended our lives. But at the same time, it, that kind of research has also subjected us to a pathologizing and um, normalizing clinical gaze. Um, and that's been experienced um, by people as a form of devaluation, a way of containing people, regulating them, segregating them from the rest of society. At the very least, disabled people have felt that their lived experiences are always subordinate to informed professional accounts or the accounts of their family members. Now, I would say that in the late 1990s and 2000s, there's been a shift within disability research. And as others will say, and Farah mentioned, it's moving from research about disabled people to research with disabled people. So that raises our first sensitivity around doing research with this particular community, and that's attending to issues of positionality. And what I mean by that is we need to ask ourselves, what's our relationship to disability? Both you as a researcher and you as a discipline or a profession. So practically speaking, disabled people and the organizations that represent uh, represent them are looking for an answer to this question um, before entering a working relationship with a, dis with a researcher. Now how you answer that question informs potential communities, the gatekeepers within that community, about how you're framing disability and what your commitments to dis disability and disabled people are. And so as a practical example, I had a graduate student um, who worked in the who's doing her master's in genetic counseling. And not surprisingly, she had a lot of trouble recruiting participants. And so what that meant is she had to send a letter to all the organizations that she was working with outlining her relationship to disability. She had a brother with Down syndrome and taking a critical but not negative stance on her discipline. And doors started to open for her. Um, on a personal level, I identify as a disabled researcher, but my work tends to be with people who've been labeled with intellectual and developmental disability. So I have to attend to the fact that I have a particular embodied experience that sort of emerges in interaction with environments and different social relationships, but that's gonna differ markedly from the relation, um, the kinds of experiences the mother who's labeled with FASD might have, or the father who's labeled with autism. So I need to uh, be self-reflexive about that difference. And part of how I do that is I layer in what might be advisory, advisory checks for myself. I don't have the right language. So the first way I do that is I partner with 
um, I collaborate with disability organizations, user-led organizations. And these are people who are often committed to cross-disability work and act as peers with me. So we can be self-reflexive together about the tensions that arise in that work. And the second thing I do is I try to work with co-researchers. So those are non-academics from the community. Um, in, in the case of my current work, people who've been labeled with intellectual disabilities. And they work as uh, assistants and helpers throughout the entire process. Everything from research conceptualization to dissemination. And it's an incredibly fruitful and generative relationship. They help um, be a check to the kind of work that we're doing, about the assumptions that we have within our work, and they help foster connections with different communities, they help with recruitment, and they bring insights to the analysis that would never have been possible it, unless they were participating. Okay, my second area of sensitivity uh, concerns issues of access and accessibility. So I tend to think of accessibility in quite generous terms, so going beyond physical logistics to thinking about the tone um, and the assumptions that we bring to our research interactions. So the practical does matter. If I look at a room like this, and I'm not trying to be critical of the organizers, this room communicates a lot to disabled researchers and members of the disability community. I can come into it, but if I was using a wheelchair, there'd be some challenges for me. In the same way, you need to sort of think about that in your research projects. So every aspect of your research project needs to involve planning and implementation around accessibility. You need recruitment posters that attend to personal support workers, wheelchair access, ASL interpretation. You may not need to use all of that, but you need to have budgeted for it or think about how to borrow it from somewhere, and you need to try. Accessibility is a moving target. It's a horizon that we're working towards. Someone is always not going to have full access, but we need to be doing things within our practice, our research practice, that communicates to disability communities that we thought about it, that they understand disabled people's um, experiences of exclusion, and that we're making an effort to transform that. And we can talk about practical examples afterwards. My, um, I would say also that you, you need to think also about the nature of research and how that tends to feed into, um, just even the research interview can feed into something like a clinical interview or a meeting with a social service provider that um, reminds disabled people of the kinds of interactions that they've had with professionals that have been forms of surveillance and containment. So working with co-researchers often can mitigate that. And again, we can talk about some practical ideas around how to make our practice more inclusive. How am I doing for time? OK. So uh, the, last, <laughs> the last thing I'd like to talk about, scary without notes, is to think about ableism in our work. So. I find that many researchers are attentive to issues of sexism and racism. They have working definitions, but I challenge people to find working definitions of disabilism and ableism, and then to identify that within our research practice. So what are the tacit assumptions about bodily standards, about health, about the way we move around the world, around, uh, around our worlds? And how do our research agendas re possibly reinforce these tacit assumptions that disabled people experience as a form of violence? So how does our research, in fact, reiterate the exclusion that disabled people are experience, experience in their everyday lives, even as we're trying to create a more inclusive space? So I'll end there. Thanks. Thank you.